Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Victoria McPhail. I'm the coordinator of the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation at York University. And we're pleased to present uh, the, the last talk in our 2022-2023 Associate Speaker Series. Um, so this has been a monthly webinar we've been having as profiles, the uh, students, postdocs, and kind of affiliates of, of BC and sharing their amazing research. And so, yes, today's our last talk for the season, but we'll start again in September. And just want to raise everyone's awareness. So we actually have kind of an internal website for associates, uh, yorku.ca slash b slash members, and I encourage you to check it out now and again. Uh, we keep all our monthly newsletters stored on that site. There's links to our speaker series, uh, past presentations, for example, like Matilda's will be up there uh, later today, probably, and information on upcoming events. We're going to have some more events happening uh, over the next couple of months, like a World Bee Day luncheon, kind of a gardening outreach event, pop some potlucks. So keep an eye on the website as well as your emails for information about those activities. In terms of today's meeting, it's actually a meeting, not a webinar, so you are able to unmute yourself and have your video on. But we do encourage you to have your mute microphone muted uh, and usually your camera off during the actual presentation. And then when we get to the question and answer period, then you can uh, kind of raise your vert in your real life hand or preferably the virtual hand uh, through the Zoom features. And then we'll call on you to ask your question. But you can then unmute yourself and turn your video camera on at that time. You can also post in the chat anytime your questions. Though again, preferably wait to the end for that type of thing. We will be recording this presentation and posting it on YouTube channel later on. So keep that in mind, particularly if you want to put your camera on, that your image will be recorded and your voice will be recorded. As I mentioned, this is the last talk for the 2022-2023 series. We are looking for presenters for our next session. So if you are an associate of BC, for example, a student or a postdoc, um, you're welcome to volunteer to give a talk. If you have research findings that you can present anytime between really September and May of next year or next season. So if you are interested, please send me an email, uh, bc at yorku.ca. And you can check out the speaker series website, yorku.ca slash b slash speaker series. I want to take a moment now to recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been taken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge our current treaty holders, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. And I want to bring your attention to this website, native-land.ca. It's a really great resource that no matter where you are in the world, generally speaking, there's information about who are the current uh, caretakers of the land, indigenous peoples for your area, and who has been there historically. So if you aren't familiar with your own region, uh, please check it out, as well as, for example, consider where you're getting your power from, your information from, where perhaps if you're studying specimens, where they come from. And try to recognize uh, the people who have helped make that happen. And now I want to introduce our speaker, Dr. Mathilde uh, Tissier. Um, Dr. Tissier is interested in the effects of nutrition on the performance of terrestrial animals. She obtained her PhD in ecology and biodiversity conservation and agricultural landscapes from the University of Strasbourg in France in 2017 after completing a BSc and MSc in exchange between France, Quebec, and British Columbia. She's now working on bumblebee conservation in collaboration with ENGOs, beekeepers, and agricultural producers in Quebec and Ontario. Her project is funded by the Libre Arrow Fellowship Program, libreaero.ca, if you want to check it out, which supports early career researchers working on biodiversity conservation in Canada. So thank you very much, Dr. Tissia, for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks uh, for inviting me and thank you for the introduction. So I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, it's loading. Okay. Let me know if it, it works well, Victoria. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. Okay, perfect. 
Well, thank you all for being here today and thank you for inviting me. I know that, um, um, well, I'm working with uh, with Sheila on my liberal project. So I will present you a bit today, part of the work uh, we've been doing in the past two years. Um, the, the project is titled uh, Solutions for Farmers and Food for Bees. Uh, and we are working with different stakeholders, as Victoria just mentioned, on uh, integrating the knowledge that we have on bee nutrition to uh, actions that could promote uh, bee conservation. But before I start, I want to take uh, uh, some moments to acknowledge that the University um, of Bishops, uh, where my liberal postdoc took place, is uh, located on the unceded territories of the Abenaki uh, people and the Wabenaki Confederacy uh, that are custodians of the lands and that are taking uh, protecting uh, the, the lands and water of uh, this area. Uh, I won't present uh, <laughs> native land here because it, it's just been done. Um, but yeah, so uh, part of the work that I, I, I will present have been done in these areas surrounding uh, Bishop's University. Just want to take a, a step back about uh, what my, what is the, the 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 framework around our project. So as you know, uh, all of you human population is really expanding. Um, we have been uh, following an exponential growth in the past uh, few um, centuries, and uh, we are now reaching uh, eight billion people um, in the planet. This uh, population, this growth in human population is associated to many changes in the landscapes associated with uh, important actions such as conventional agriculture, trying to uh, follow up with this exponential growth in uh, human food production, uh, but also with uh, urbanization. And these um, uh, um, human um, actions are associated with the uh, ecosystem altera alteration. Uh, there are different uh, type of alteration. I won't go into the details now because I, I want to go <laughs> deep into the, the, the project. But uh, the one I'm interested in is how ecosystems are changed, not only in their functionality, but also in their um, uh, diversity at the local scale and how this can uh, have an impact not only on um, population dynamics, but on the behavior of animals and on their ability to have uh, sustainable, um, uh, an adapted health. So one of the, the, the main features of, of uh, these changes in agriculture is the, the spread of large monocultures uh, across the globe. Uh, this um, this is uh, the case for many crops. We we have in mind, uh, of course, uh, corn and, and uh, soy or uh, canola, but um, it's, of course, uh, as you know, spread for many cultures. And these monocultures are associated with a homogenization of the of the landscape. Um, so we lack diversity of plants and of uh, landscape features. And this has different impacts. And the one I'm really interested in is how it's constraining uh, animals that live in these landscapes to uh, monotonous diets. And these monotonous diets that will be um, that I will characterize by diet dominated, so with 80% or more um, dominance in part of the of the season of one uh, or two uh, plants, in that case crops. And these monotonous diets will have an impact on the health and behavior of animals and their reproduction survival and ultimately affecting their population dynamics. Most of the studies on the topic have uh, been focused on the uh, energy balance, so the calorie intake uh, in, in food and the calorie that was used, that is used by animals, and uh, how um, the carbohydrate and proteins that ca can get be uh, uh, obtained from these diets will impact these different traits. But there is an increasing co uh, concern and interest for the um, um, broad nutritional balance, including the intake in vitamins, but also in um, uh, different plant secondary compounds and in also in amino acid balance, which are the precursors of most of the essential vitamins. And my talk will focus mostly on the vitamin B3 and its precursor in terms of research, uh, science and the scientific interest. And then I will, I will um, transfer that to how we can work with the uh, different stakeholders to include this knowledge to conservation. Just a bit about why I'm interested in vitamin B3 and, and uh, so you can understand its importance for uh, health, behavior, reproduction, and survival in all animals. So um, this is a, a small graph showing uh, the metabolism. It's uh, uh, um, uh, simplified, of course, but the metabolism of tryptophan and vitamin B3, which are both essential nutrients in all animals, from insects to mammals. So this representation is in mammals. I will show that in insects. 
But the tryptophan is the precursor then of vitamin B3, which can be decomposed into two different molecules, nicotinic acid and nicotinamide. Both of them uh, modulate more than 400 enzymes in humans and, uh, and other mammals. Uh, nicotinamide is uh, activating uh, the silkworm gene, and so it's involved in DNA repair, aging, and tumor suppression uh, in, in mammals. It's also the main precursor of NAD and NADH, which in the mitochondria will uh, be essential for ATP synthesis, but also um, uh, redox reactions, so oxidative stress, immunity, etc. So many functions, uh, metabolic functions, uh, are um, modulated by NAD+. It's also activating the, the gene that is synthesizing, synthesizing uh, oxytocin, a hormone really important for maternal behavior, paternal, uh, parental attachment, and social interactions in mammals. Then tryptophan is also the precursor of serotonin, which can be obtained also from catabolism of vitamin B3. And in mammals, in the hippocampus, these um, serotonin and nicotinamide are having a, a lot of different uh, functions. They modulate... Um, addictions and anti-predatory behavior in, in mammals, mood and depression in humans. So they, it's known to be involved, for instance, in, uh, in depression. Um, they modulate learning, spatial memory, appetite, and food intake. So it's really broad. And then you have also the synthesis of melatonin, another uh, important um, biomolecule, which is uh, modulating uh, uh, circadian rhythm and sleep, but also glucose homeostasis. So this is in mammals, but what is really interesting with this metabolism is that if you look in plants or in insects, it's really conserved. So if you look at insects, mostly nothing changes. You just replace uh, oxytocin by inotocin or uh, the, the hippocampus by the mushroom bodies. And you have a lot of different and similar impact in insects of, this meta of these molecules. Uh, melatonin will uh, modulate molt and diapose, but uh, inotocin can modulate reproductive behavior and social interactions. So what I want to show is that uh, these molecules are really important for a variety of, of uh, behavioral and metabolic functions, physiological functions. So what we know is that vitamin B3 and tryptophan must be obtained from the diet on a daily basis because we are, we animals, uh, insects uh, to, to mammals, are unable to synthesize them. And they are really essential because they modulate many, uh, they are the precursors of many important uh, biomolecules and they, um, they are at the core of ATP synthesis. And in that way, they will uh, modulate behavior, appetite and metabolism. Uh, we know a lot about how the deficiencies of the, in these nutrients will impact uh, behavior, health of uh, humans and domestic animals and also livestock. So for instance, in humans, uh, deficiencies in vitamin B3 and tryptophan are known to cause pellagra, a disease that causes uh, dermatitis, which is uh, skin uh, rashes, diarrhea and dementia. And ultimately, if it's not treated, uh, it leads to death. In dogs, it's caused the black tongue syndrome, which is a, an important metabolic syndrome with um, blood clots that will form. In fish, in salmon uh, and other farm fish, it has been associated with a, a reduction in uh, um, the ability to deal with thermic stress. Um, deficiency uh, in vitamin B3 and uh, tryptophan leads to growth retards in calves, but also in rats. And in rats, we also see an, an increase in aggressiveness. Finally, in the domestic honeybee, uh, deficiencies in, in these nutrients will impair the ability to um, uh, orient in space. Um, and so this is the knowledge, broadly knowledge that we have, but we also know that supplementation in vitamin B3 and tryptophan in humans are increasingly used uh, for important, to treat important diseases such as um, uh, myopathy, some cancer, and also uh, some viral infection. So we have extensive knowledge in humans and domestic animals. I don't, didn't present uh, it all here because I want to focus on, on, the, on wildlife, but also on bees. Um, this extensive knowledge is really interesting because it's going from insects to fish to mammals, uh, including humans. And although we have this knowledge, we don't know much about wildlife and uh, animals in an ecological context. This is where my research is taking place. Um, as I said, we don't know much, but what we know is that there is a, an important gradient in the, in the content in tryptophan and vitamin B3 in all plants. So as you see, you have the plants that are really deficient in uh, tryptophan and vitamin B3, which are corn and dandelion. They are the most deficient ones. 
And then you have a gradient up to, to as far as I know, uh, to Red Maple, which is uh, really rich. So it's like more than 100 richer than uh, the, the deficient uh, plants. As you can see, uh, uh, plants here on this part of the gradient uh, are the plants that we find in uh, farmlands most of the time. So crops are kind of having a low uh, content in tryptophan and vitamin B3 compared to what we can find in many tree species. And during my previous work, um, I show that deficiencies in tryptophan and vitamin B3 associated with the corn consumption lead to behavioral and reprodu reproductive disorders in an endangered uh, rodent. So I don't want to show everything just to uh, show you an, um, an, an overview of the impact that these deficiencies can have to then uh, translate that to bees. But what we've shown, oh, too late, too, too fast. <laughs> so what we showed here in this study is that um, consumption of uh, corn by hamsters led to uh, maternal infanticides and behavioral disorders, as was observed in humans, uh, as I just mentioned before. And so hamsters that were fed with corn, and even though they had proper protein intakes, they could not manage to win proper litters. Although we had a comparison with the uh, uh, hamsters that were, uh, that ate wheat, and in that case, these hamsters were, so you have the number of pups weaned per female here. And interestingly, just a, a vitamin B3 supplementation in these groups completely restored maternal behavior. So here you have hamsters that were fed the exact same diet than the one that fed, were fed um, corn and worm for protein intakes. And the supplementation of vitamin B3 only uh, restored maternal behavior and restored reproductive success and allowed females to win their litters. So this knowledge was quite new in wildlife. We, we didn't expect such results at the beginning. But what was really interesting is that this project was um, done in collaboration with uh, farmers. So we didn't do the research and then uh, translate it, it to farmers. We at each step of the process um, during my PhD, I collaborated with farmers and we implemented some consultations. And once we had this uh, knowledge that corn was an issue for hamsters because the mother that were eating corns, which is uh, really dominant in the landscape in this region, uh, they were killing their pups. Then farmers started to be really proactive on how we could change uh, this issue, well, how we could have an impact on this issue. And so through this consultation, we identified a, a plant that was um, uh, favorable and uh, for hamsters and of interest for, for farmers. So we tested, uh, um, we, we did a lot of different experiments, but ultimately what it um, led to is that farmers, because they heard at the end from us that sunflower was beneficial for uh, hamsters to compensate corn deficiencies, uh, they started to spread sunflower in the middle of their cornfields, or they included sunflower in uh, intermediate cropping between wheat and corn. And this happened without having to change any policy or anything. So just the, the fact of working um, step by step with the farmers led to these kind of uh, actions from them. After that, we generalized this kind of uh, finding uh, on different other species, including the European brown hair. But Ultimately, we were a bit um, limited in our ability to expand the, 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 the weight of this, well, the, the impact of these results on the changes in uh, farming, um, farming practices. Mostly because hamsters are now so endangered that you can just find them in really uh, relictual place or populations and places in, in Europe. Um, and because even though European brown hair um, was studied mostly in, in, uh, in Austria in that case. Um, these species are declining uh, in Europe. They are not so common anymore, and mostly they are not of um, high interest in uh, farming uh, landscapes because we have a hard time to show, even though they are important for the ecosystems, uh, we are having a hard time to show their importance for farmers and for farming. This is, uh, yeah, so that's what I, I was saying. Um, and so this is when I, I started to work on bees, uh, not because, not only because of that, I wanted to work on bees since I was a child, but I don't know why my research path led me to work on mammals. I love mammals as well. But so when I, I, uh, I finished my PhD, I decided to switch on bees because I wanted to, and because I thought it would be also an important, um, an important a step to be able to then convince farmers of the benefits of changing practices. So 
Okay, I have an issue with my um, <laughs> animations. So uh, this is when uh, we worked with a, a team in France to translate what we found in hamsters to bumblebees. So in I will show you the study in which we uh, uh, reduced uh, tractophan intake and supplemented in vitamin B3 to observe the impact that these nutrients could have on bumblebees. So uh, this study was conducted um, on bumblebees, so what is the interest of looking at these deficiencies? I told you that corn is deficient in uh, um, tryptophan and vitamin B3. Uh, corn is um, mostly sp pollinated by, by wind, as you probably know, but even though it's, it's pollinated by wind, doesn't mean that uh, its pollen is not um, uh, ingested by bees or consumed. And so in honeybees, we know that in summer, up to 50% of, the, of their diet is composed of pollen in July and August when corn is, in, is flowering. And it has been, this consumption has been associated with a reduced uh, lifespan of the workers. In bumblebees, we have uh, much less knowledge, but there are some studies showing that the bumblebee workers collect corn, uh, corn pollen when it's available in the landscape. And as I told you, there, is, there are other plants that are deficient, such as uh, dandelion, that are really deficient in tryptophan and vitamin B3. So we conducted a study with a, a team of researchers in the south of France, in Toulouse, on commercial uh, terrestrial bumblebees. And what we've done in this uh, study is that we uh, experimentally reduced uh, dietary, trapto dietary tryptophan to mimic the reduction that we can find in corn and dandelion pollen. And we supplemented them in vitamin B3 in that case to mimic what we could find in uh, sunflower um, pollen. So we monitored them for three weeks. We monitored the food intake, aggressiveness, survival. And uh, to monitor the aggressiveness, we um, uh, conducted behavioral trials where we exposed um, uh, bumblebee workers from uh, uh, same colony, same treatment, and different colonies to monitor their, their behavior and see how their social interactions could be impacted by the, by the deficiencies or the supplementation. And here you have the survival of the of the workers uh, through the, the uh, three week studies, and um, you have here the control diet, which is uh, the optimal amino acid composition that we could find in uh, pollen that were shown to optimize reproduction uh, in uh, in these species. Then you have uh, the low tryptophan diet here in gray. Um, which is mimicking the deficiency in tryptophan that we can find in corn and dandelion pollen. But all the other amino acids were really identical to this one. So it was just a reduction of um, a tryptophan. And uh, then you have the medium tryptophan, which is an intermediate between the low tryptophan and the control diet. And finally, you have the low tryptophan plus niacin, so uh, uh, vitamin B3, which is mimicking the level, well, the content of vitamin B3 that we find in sunflower pollen. So as you can see in this graph, the low tryptophan diet uh, reduced the survival of the workers uh, significantly compared to the other diets. And simply um, adding the vitamin B3 allowed to uh, uh, restore uh, survival. So compensated for the deficiency in, in tryptophan. We also had a similar impact on behavior. So here you have um, the average number of uh, attacks, which were different at different levels, but we didn't characterize the levels at that time. So attacks could be only um, some threats with mandib mandibular opened or really uh, real attacks. So as you can he see here, the low tryptophan diet had significantly more um, attacks in the interaction that we monitored uh, compared to the, the other diet. So attacks means that the, it's, we are focal, the, the focal individual was the one of the low tryptophan diet, so they, they were attacking more. And interestingly, in that case as well, the fact of supplementing uh, with vitamin B3 reduced uh, the attacks uh, and the uh, aggressive interactions between bumblebees. As I said, we didn't quantify the intensity of the attacks, but we should have, because then during these experiments, we also recorded some uh, really intense attacks between um, um, workers of the same macro colonies, surprisingly. So here it's a short video to show you the intensity of this kind of attack. So this is the focal individual and it's attacking another bee, but this attack lasted for 20 minutes and the focal individual then died. So it's um, abnormal behavior uh, to be recorded in this kind of, ex of, um, 
of um, experiments between social insects. So we can see while we, we showed here and we I, I was kind of surprised to see the strong impact of tryptophan and vitamin B, B3 uh, deficiencies in uh, social insects because we know that in mammals like ra mostly rodents actually um, these deficiencies are causing um, high aggressiveness levels so it's been shown in, in, in uh, rats and, and mice but we also observe that in hamsters we were not expecting to find this kind of results in bumblebees but so this is confirming the importance of these nutrients uh, for behavioral interactions and survival of, of bumblebees. And then it's uh, raising questions on the benefits of sunflower for bees as well, because we uh, really focused on the content that is found in sunflower. And it seems to be um, a level that is uh, uh, beneficial for, for bumblebees. And in hamsters, we found that it was a good crop to compensate the deficiencies of corn. So this is bringing me to uh, the benefits of sunflower for bees and to this time um, it's done uh, in, in Europe and France, I'm in Canada. And so I've been working with uh, Lynn Adler and Valérie Fournier on a pilot study to, um, to monitor the benefits of uh, sunflower in the wilds for uh, bombus impatience. So we worked on the southern part of, of Quebec in different locations and we studied the benefits of sunflower in that case for the health of bumblebees. I, uh, you, you are probably aware of the work of Lynn Adler, but just to, to give a, um, a quick overview, um, her team showed that sunflower pollen has uh, important medicinal values for bumblebees. Um, there are many different studies showing that. So when we talk about medicinal values, it means that workers and queens that are infected with the um, gut parasite, uh, Critidia bombi, are able to get rid of the pathogens, uh, the, patho the, the, yeah, the pathogen, the cells of these parasites uh, with the, the sunflower. So there is, this is a, a, uh, one of the graphs, but they infected um, uh, bees with um, critidia and they looked at the parasite load, so the number of cells that we, they will find the gut of the bees uh, with different pollen. And they used uh, buckwheat, canola, wildflower mix, and sunflower. And you can see that uh, the parasite, parasite load is really reduced when bees were fed sunflower pollen. And they confirmed this kind of results in um, uh, mesocos, so intense, in uh, some uh, uh, semi-wild settings. And our goal in this pilot study in Quebec was to, um, to have a look at how bees were infected or not in uh, following a sunflower gradient in corn dominated landscape because my interest is still in how to find solutions to improve corn um, monocultures. So we monitored, we captured bumblebees in different uh, on different sites in this pilot study in corn dominated landscape and in corn with sunflower as well as in sunflower um, uh, uh, surrounding sunflower fields. And we had two goals. First, it was to validate a non-invasive approach to assess bee health, so bumblebees' uh, health. And so what we use here, it's um, a way, well, we capture bees and we place them in a petri dish, which is commonly do done in, in uh, laboratory settings. Then we collected the feces, we released the bees, and we analyzed the parasite loads under the microscope. Uh, we use different um, approach uh, to get bees to defecate. The best one was to use a cooler uh, without ice to place the bee in a dark environment, not too hot, too warm, and it improved uh, feces, feces collection. Then analyzing uh, feces under the microscope, we could confirm the presentation of different uh, uh, gut uh, parasites, including cells of uh, Critidia um, species. And so we use this data just to have an overview of um, the health status of the bees in these landscapes. This is a quite a time consuming approach and we can miss some information when we only look at parasite loads under the microscope. So what we are doing in parallel is that we are um, trying to validate an approach of genomics on the fecal samples in collaboration with uh, uh, Declan Schroeder from the University of Minnesota. So we collected all this information and the next step will be to, to confirm uh, whether we can have enough um, um, genetic material from the feces, fecal samples to uh, conduct genomic analysis. And the second approach was to look at the health of bumblebees in corn dominated dominated landscapes. And here you have um, a graph. So we captured 48 bees in total. 
and you have the parasite load of the bees, uh, depending on the type of landscape. So following these gradients, so corn only, corn with sunflower and sunflower only. And what we could find here, what we, we found is that bumblebees were more infected in corn dominant landscapes than in uh, more diverse or in the presence of, of sunflower. So this is really a pilot study and preliminary data, but this is uh, encouraging us to uh, conduct more studies like this to have a bigger uh, view of uh, parasite loads in bumblebees in different type of habitats. And so if I go back to this graph of, uh, of um, the, the vitamin B3 and tryptophan in ecology, so um, we showed that deficiencies in tryptophan and vitamin B3 uh, led to behavioral or reproductive disorders in different species. And then supplementations mimicking what we could find in sunflower, uh, increase reproductive success, reduce aggressiveness, and improve health in different bumblebee species. Then you have, uh, we were focused on, on uh, farming landscapes, but then you have, as I said, other plants that are, have really, really great contents of these nutrients, including red maple. And uh, during my previous postdocs, I worked on chipmunks before uh, <laughs> switching again to bees. Um, so I'm doing this uh, bees, uh, mammals um, uh, work, and I, I really like the, to, to translate information to, between uh, the two. Anyway, so during my postdoc on chipmunks in, in Quebec with um, Denis Réal, Danny Garand, and, and Patrick Bergeron, we, we worked on this uh, monitoring of chipmunks, and we found that the consumption of red maple by chipmunks increased their reproductive success seemed to trigger uh, reproduction in females, or at least uh, was associated to a high um, estrus in females. And we found some impact on aging aging processes in chipmunks, only from the consumption of red maple. And as I show here, red maple is really uh, rich in, um, in vitamin B3 and tryptophan. And so this brought new information to this uh, gradient on the importance of these nutrients for uh, wildlife. But then how can we apply this knowledge to bee conservation and to sustainable agriculture and tr uh, transfer this knowledge to concrete uh, actions in the field? Uh, this is where uh, my liberal project uh, comes in. So this project is a, um, it's, is a multi-partner project. So here you have the, I would say, the core team or the people that helped um, uh, building the project and, and uh, developing the ideas. So you have different people from academia, you know Sheila, you have Valérie Fournier from University Laval, Lynn Adler from UMass in Massachusetts, uh, Patrick Bergeron from Bishop's University, who is my main uh, mentor, and a conservation's um, partner, so Caroline Callahan and Sarah McKell and John Vievreau from Wildlife Preservation Canada. And this project is really built in this idea of having the research and trying to find ways to really um, implement it, not, uh, well, I would say before having to change uh, policies. So I, I will show you with some examples. So this is the construction of the of the project. Uh, Sheila must have uh, seen this uh, this slide a uh, hundred times. But uh, so we have the research on nutrition uh, with a focus on vitamin B3 and tryptophan, but we consider many other aspects at the core. And then we we have different type of actions uh, that are all connected together. So we have what we call, I call preparatory actions where we elaborate uh, management and concrete actions. And then the knowledge that is gathered here is directly transferred to uh, concrete conservation actions and we, where we monitor the impact on um, either some conservation or uh, agricultural parameters. And finally, you have the knowledge transfer and dissemination of information and public awareness. So I will present you some of the different actions, not all of them, and then we can chat more on uh, any one of them if you're interested. Um, so the, the first preparatory action that we implemented uh, in, with the help of two undergrad students from Bishop's University, Marianne and Gabrielle, is that we conducted surveys. Uh, so it was semi-structured uh, surveys that were anonymous and bilingual, so French and English in uh, Quebec and Ontario. So the idea was uh, at the beginning to perhaps extend it to other regions uh, surrounding these two provinces, but for now we started only in Quebec and Ontario, mostly because of the network that we had that allowed us to spread the, the surveys uh, uh, immediately. And so in these surveys, we asked uh, farmers and beekeepers different questions. So it was completely voluntary and we had 123 participants that uh, responded to the surveys. 
So some questions were really broad, like have you ever thought about implementing a native pollinator friendly practice on your uh, property? 80, 85% said yes, 15% said no. What I, I found really interesting is that even though the survey is anonymous, we asked some information on their type of practices, whether they were um, doing organic farming, conventional farming, and we have a really good representation of the diversity of farming practices in Canada, well, in Eastern Canada. Uh, many farmers that responded to the surveys were doing conventional farming as well. So I, I was pleased to see their interest in this kind of, of surveys for um, bees, uh, bee conservation. Um, when we asked whether they would be interested in learning more about the practices that support the establishment of native pollinators on their property, 93% uh, said yes, uh, it, the number is missing, but 7% said no. 7% um, may seem high, not the high, but uh, actually the most people that answered no, uh, it's anonymous, but we have a code for every participant, so we can know uh, who said no. Um, the most that said no, um, it's because they knew a lot already and they even suggested some actions that could be favorable to pollinators. Then we have this uh, kind of information. So what type of pollinator friendly practices would you be willing to implement? The idea here is to, to have a broad overview of what is working for farmers and what isn't. So then when we find um, a positive um, well, when we find information on, on positive impact on nutrition, for instance, we can really have a good recommendation at the end and not recommend something that will not work for farmers. So the, the overall response is, uh, of course, pollinator, pollinator habitat strips works pretty well, well, is interesting for farmers. I was quite surprised by the high rate of people uh, interested in windbreaks. Um, especially because I uh, perhaps I have this European uh, um, mind, mindset where there is no space, so trees are too big and we don't have space to put trees in the field. But farmers were quite interested about windbreaks. So this is interesting, but the idea is uh, to have then more information on, on the, um, the type of practices that would be interesting for different type of farming. For instance, people uh, growing corn or people growing uh, blueberries, because uh, we have this information in the in the survey, even though it's all anonymous and, and coded. So I will be able to go deeper in this uh, kind of analysis. Then we had other type of questions. What type of companion plant would be appropriate in your situation? Do you prefer annual flowering plants? It's the first one, perennial, uh, bushes and trees, I don't know, other, and some of them suggested some, some options. Here again, I want to have a, a, a view of uh, what blueberry or cranberry uh, growers will be more interested in compared to uh, corn and soy or to uh, greenhouse producers, etc., because we can have then adjusted recommendation based on their interests. And finally, some, oh, okay, really? Okay, no, it's I, I forgot the graph. So then another uh, preparatory action uh, is to characterize the um, monofloral and bumblebee pollen. So um, we had different ways of collecting the pollen. So we worked with the uh, beekeepers that have a really extensive way of um, of managing their uh, beehives. So it's honey beehives, but they they are growing a lot of native flowers. They have a, a few number of hives, a high overwintering success and they breed themselves the, the, the queen, they don't buy from the industry. And um, we also captured some bumblebees in the fields uh, surrounding Bishop's University. And the idea was really to characterize all the biochemical composition of different native uh, pollen, but also of different crops. So we don't have a lot so far, but we have buckwheat and corn and many different wildflowers from trees to um, to bushes to some uh, important flowers and a commercial wildflower mix that is commonly used to uh, feed um, bumblebees in, in laboratory settings. And so what we are doing with this uh, pollen in this uh, preparatory action is to uh, char characterize the, the um, different nutrients that we can find inside. So uh, minerals, vitamins, so many different vitamins, including the vitamin B3, but also all the other associated vitamins, vitamin C and vitamin A as well. And we have the total proteins, fats, and carbohydrates of the pollen. What is interesting, so this, uh, these analyses are ongoing with the 
colleagues at the University of Sherbrooke. And what is really interesting and encouraging here is that we only need a uh, maximum one gram of pollen to conduct these analyses. And some of them can even be done um, in really small samples of 0 0.1 gram, uh, which is really making possible to measure what bumblebee collected. And so at the end, it's really the goal is to characterize what bumblebee collect in the field in terms of nutrients and what is available to them, to, to them in different landscapes. And so if we see, for instance, that corn, we know, but is deficient in tryptophan and vitamin B3 or vitamin B3 and proteins, then in the, the species that we find, we could recommend, for instance, red maple that is really rich in these nutrients so that they could compensate uh, one another. And so this was a, um, a lot of work. I just want to highlight that because collecting the pollen is something. And then when you have, so this is the honeybee collected pollen. Then we had to um, separate them to, um, to have monoflora, monofloral pollen and to analyze under the microscope to, com uh, to confirm the species. So here we had a mix of uh, red maple and pussy willow, uh, essentially. And it's like hours of work before being able to have uh, samples. Because we don't only analyze the samples, we also use them uh, in another preparatory actions to um, to feed uh, wild caught queens. So this is another goal that we had in the Libero project uh, with um, Sarah from Wildlife Preservation Canada, is that we tested uh, rain maple pollen compared to wildflower mix uh, on the performance of wild caught queens. So we captured queens at the emergence of um, of we, uh, after winter and we captured them so um, end of April to mid-May approximately and we uh, brought them to um, the conservation uh, lab of Wildlife Preservation Canada where we bred them with different type of, uh, of pollen and uh, we then monitored them uh, through reproduction and up to the, the next uh, winter phase. So just a, an overview of the of the um, of the protocol. Uh, so we had 20 queens of Bombus impatiens that were caught in the wild and 20 queens of Bombus griseocolis. So this study was conducted in 2021. And briefly, we had two groups, a control group with only uh, the mix of wildflower that was provided as a pollen source for the bees. We also provided a nectar solution and um, ad libitum, so they had plenty of food. And for the red maple group, it was the, the, the bees were fed the 100% mix then switch to uh, rain maple for uh, with a 50-50% uh, mix of rain maple and, and the wildflower. And then to a 75% rain maple and 25% mix to really see how, uh, what is um, uh, the nutritional value of, of uh, rain maple for queens. And this lasted for a different period of time. So the first period, during the first period, uh, the queens were fed either with the wax pollen ball uh, of mix of the wildflower mix or the wax pollen ball of the rain maple plus uh, a bit of the wildflower mix. So for the rain maple control group, uh, rain maple group. And as soon as the first worker emerged in the colonies, uh, we supplemented, we, we started phase two, which is uh, continuing until the end. Uh, and in this phase two, we provided an additional pollen for each worker produced. So uh, for all the groups in that case, we provided mix of flour, which means that the red maple group, uh, they were provided when workers emerged, they were provided one wax pollen ball um, with the red maple and, and uh, mix, but then there were all the additional pollen was mixed. And this lasted for 50 days approximately. And then we ended supplementation for all, uh, all bees and we monitor the queens until the end. And I didn't precise, but uh, half of the bombus impatiens were to the uh, um, fed the, were in the control group, and half were in the red maple group, and same for bombus griseocolis. And I just want to show briefly the results here. So we have, of course, what is quite known in bumblebee in in this species, uh, a species effect on the colony size. So this is the number. The first graph is the number of uh, of workers. 
And so you have the number of workers uh, for Griseocolis and you have the number of workers for Bombus impatiens. So Bombus impatiens produce much larger colonies, which is not a surprise, but it's uh, it's interesting to see how it it, uh, it works in, in um, lab settings. Then you have the number of males produced. So the same here, uh, Griseocolis produced uh, less males than uh, Bombus impatiens. And then you have the gynes. Interestingly, um, Griseocolis produced more gynes. So impatiens invested a lot in workers and in males, but produced much less uh, gynes. So in Griseocolis, you have a lot of zeros because a lot of queens did not produce uh, gynes, but still some of them uh, uh, produced um, more and it, it was the difference was uh, significant. Then we also had a diet effect, uh, but not on all parameters. So the broad uh, message is that we had a greater probability uh, of producing workers, males and gynes uh, in females fed the red maple. But once they initiated a colony, um, they did not produce more workers. So we don't, the, the distribution is a bit weird here, but we don't have um, um, bigger uh, colonies in the red maple group, even though we have more females producing colonies. Then, um, Okay, I have really issues with my <laughs> animation, I'm sorry. So then you have the number of males produced. And in that case, however, uh, the, the colonies with the red maple produced um, more. Uh, so you have the distribution here in the mixed group. And you can see that the median is at zero, even though one colony produced almost uh, 500 males. But then you have in the red maple a much uh, a greater variation, but also the median is greater and the the the... The difference is significant, meaning that they produced uh, more males on average. And finally, for the gynes, you have the same kind of results. So here you have the Griseocolis group uh, species and impatient species and the diet. So uh, in Griseocolis, the, the, the queen fed red maple produced more gynes on average. And in the um, impatient species, they produced really uh, more gynes on average because the the gyne of this species, uh, the queen of this species, uh, fed the mixed flower group uh, pollen, did not produce any gyne. So this is a lot of results, and I just want I, I like to summarize this way because you have the probability, the number of queens, workers, males, etc. But if you look at the overall results from um, a population dynamic point of view, this is making a huge difference. So we had in each um, diet group for Bombus impatiens, 10 queens fed uh, the mix and 10 queens fed only uh, white flowers. And if you look at the number of workers produced and the number of males and gynes, it's three to five um, times more than what we had in the control group fed the, the mix, uh, the white flowers. Even though this supplementation only occurred for um, uh, approximately one third of the experiment, and uh, it was not hundred percent, they were fed also with the uh, white flowers, white flower pollen. Sorry, and for Bourbon's Griseocolis, it's approximately the same results. Even though we can see uh, that they invested much more in uh, gain production than in workers and uh, males. So this is something we, do, we did in 2021. In 2022, we reconducted the study with uh, Bombus tericola at that moment and Bombus griseocolis uh, with some changes in, in the protocol. And in 2023, we will do the same, uh, but included as well uh, Bombus ternarius to compare and to see whether it's a, a species that respond um, more like Bombus tericola uh, compared to uh, Bombus griseocolis. So that's done for the preparatory uh, uh, concrete actions. And I just have a, a few slides remaining. I want to present one uh, kind of concrete action where we transfer the knowledge that we uh, gathered here to uh, conservation actions. So we use sunflowers to try to improve bumblebee health in different uh, environments. So because of the, the study that I showed before, uh, sunflower seems to be a good um, uh, plant resource to improve uh, health parameters of bumblebees in different um, environments. So uh, we, we work in greenhouses, tomato and zucchini uh, productions mostly, where um, growers use uh, commercial bumblebee hives. 
But we also work in blueberry fields um, where uh, there is not a lot of diversity when uh, uh, blueberry stops uh, flowering. So we try to improve the uh, um, availability of resources uh, using sunflower after uh, the bloom of blueberries. And the idea is we need to work on reducing uh, the, the, the prevalence of uh, Critidia uh, bombi to prevent the spread of the parasites to wild bees, because many studies have shown that the use of commercial bumblebee hives uh, is associated to an increase in the, in the spread of this parasite, uh, among others, to wild bees surrounding greenhouses. And so what we've done is that we uh, uh, planted sunflower in different uh, uh, greenhouses, in different blueberry fields, and we look at the impact on the uh, health of workers and queens. Um, in that case, what was interesting is that we uh, used dwarf sunflower mostly because farmers expressed that their main limitation in uh, greenhouses was the space, and there was the space. So we didn't have enough space to plant normal sunflower. So we adjusted to the limits of uh, farmers uh, so that we could uh, plant sunflower in their greenhouses. And so what we found here is that uh, we had a sunflower gradient from uh, zero flowers to uh, 100. 100 is like the maximum we could put, for instance, in the greenhouse. And if you look at the parasite load, you can see that when there is no sunflower, it can go really high. But as soon as you have sunflower, it seems to be really uh, limited to um, a, a few um, uh, cells per individual. So these are preliminary data as well. So we will continue working on these kind of setups to uh, to improve the impact that we can have on, on changes in farming practices. And by working directly with farmers, uh, uh, we we have a direct channel from science to uh, implementation instead of going through uh, changes in, in, in policies. And now we are also working on uh, trying to find perennial plants or bushes that could have the similar, the same impact than sunflower, mostly for uh, studies outside, so in, in cornfields or blueberry fields, because uh, farmers, growers express that um, uh, they don't really like having to uh, plant uh, flowers every year, so they will prefer something perennial. And so we are, for instance, considering the J Jerusalem artichoke, which has, uh, um, which is really close to sunflower and could have the same um, health properties. And finally, I just want to have a note on the knowledge transfer and public awareness uh, dissemination of information, and then I will be uh, done. So one other question that we asked farmers in our surveys in the, is that um, we wanted to know in which format they would like to be um, kept informed about pollinator friendly measures. So um, there was like indoor information dissemination workshop, workshops and presentation in the field, etc. And most of them said the website. So um, we created a website at the beginning of the project. So Solution for Farmers and Food for Bees, SFFB, and SPPB in French. So it's a bilingual website. And we have a lot of different information, resources for farmers, for uh, teachers. And we try to, to have that uh, running so they could have all the up-to-date information there. Uh, then we also created some different um, posters to inform farmers uh, with whom we are working uh, about key information related to, to bees. Most of them just uh, know the honeybee as, as you may be aware, but so having this in like simple sheets and with a, a lot of information that can then be found with more details on the website is a way of keeping them informed. The benefits of sunflower as well, has, uh, these uh, posters were made by myself and Solange Barrault. And the last one is uh, to inform them about the risks of the um, commercial hives and associated solutions to mitigate or uh, reduce these risks. So that's about it. I will end on that note, but I want to thank first all the people involved. So I presented at the beginning the, the core team, but there are also a lot of different scientists with whom uh, we are working, research professionals, uh, agronomists and biologists uh, from the industry in that case that are supporting the project and the transfer to, to farmers. And of course, all the producers uh, that were involved in the project, uh, agronomic advisors as well, uh, beekeepers, palynologists, and ecologists uh, with whom we are working, and some other uh, colleagues, um, chemists and beekeepers that are helping with all our um, pollen collection, uh, chemical analysis of pollen, etc. So thank you all for your attention.
and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Awesome. Thank you, Matilda. Amazing presentation. People, you're encouraged <laughs> to use your action button to give her a hand, thumbs up or a heart or whatever kind of action item you would like. Um, and then, yes, if you'd like to ask a question, you can raise your uh, virtual hand. There's a little option there um, at the bottom of your screen, or you can put in the chat uh, your question. Or if you'd like to ask slides again and just say, yes, a big thank you to Matilda. Thank you so much. And everyone's, you know, so enthusiastic with your talk and looking forward to you from the publications so we can share the data a bit fuller. Um, and just a reminder that uh, though we're finished for kind of this season for our speaker series, we are starting again up in the fall and September 15th will be a speaker I'll talk about the regulatory changes underlying the transition to social behavior in Saratina Calcerata. And again, if you're interested in giving a presentation, you know that I'm one of the associates um, in BC who might be, um, please feel, feel free to reach out to me. We have openings between kind of September and May of next year. Uh, so yes, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you especially Mathilde for your presentation. And yes, we'll see you all um, in the fall for this speaker series or again, we still have more speaker series with the systematics and biogeography series of BC hosts as well coming up. So yes, thank you all and yeah, keep in touch.